Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Sava, and today we're going to investigate a key concept and a key econometric technique that arguably gave birth to factor modeling and asset pricing as we know it, that is, the farmer macbeth regression. The motivation of the farmer macbeth regression is to determine the risk premium of a particular risk factor, and originally farmer and macbeth applied it to the conventional market factor, as in CAPM. What is the risk premium investors enjoy by taking on the beta, the conventional market beta that makes stock returns fluctuate in line with the market. We all know beta of one is the market risk exposure, beta lower than one means that stock is less risky than the market, beta of higher than one means that the stock is riskier than the market. But does this provide investors with a reliable premium? And if yes, how high this premium is. And one of the problems that Farmer and Macbeth have tried to solve in their 1973 seminal paper in the Journal of Political Economy is how to avoid uh, data measurement errors when you try to regress returns on estimated betas with some error in them, and how to prevent heteroscedasticity from affecting the significance of the results. So here we have got a quite large and representative data set. We have got 443 stocks from the S&P 500 index over a 10-year period and the index itself. Quite naturally, we can calculate daily returns of all of our stocks by just dividing price today by the price yesterday and subtracting one, as well as doing it for the index itself. We can use some control R manipulations to do all of the calculations faster. And having calculated all of the daily returns for individual stocks in the benchmark as well, we can proceed to calculating their betas using the slope function. So for example, the beta of A would be its daily returns regressed onto the S&P 500 returns. And as the market is, well, universal across all of these stocks, indeed, it presents the factor we seek to investigate the risk pricing for, we have to lock the columns here. And then, having calculated the beta, we can calculate the average annual return of this stock. And given the fact we have the prices, it is a very quick and easy calculation. We could divide the price at the end by the price at the start. Keeping in mind we have got 10 years and we seek annualized return, we just raise to the power of 1 over 10 and subtract 1, giving us a 20.38% average annual return um, with a beta exposure of 1.07. It seems that our return is a little bit higher than average with a little bit higher than average beta. So this stock has uh, some promising uh, tendencies with regards to CAPM being correct and the market beta indeed uh, leading to higher returns on average. However, to check this and test this rigorously, we have to apply the same functions for all 443 sample stocks. And the intuition here would simply um, lead you to calculating a linear regression of annual returns onto estimated betas. So we could do something like Linus of these annualized returns of individual stocks onto their betas and uh, then we need to specify that we do need the constant that would be interpretable here as risk-free return or return that is unattributable to the beta factor loading or to market risk and we'll need one as we would want additional statistics reported as well and as we apply this function we would see that the risk premium for unit exposure to uh, market risk, so for a beta of 1, is around 4% per annum, with, on average, more than 10% being unexplained. And these are correct estimations of risk premium and the risk-free or unattributed return. 
However, these standard errors can be uh, inconsistent simply because our beta estimations are noisy due to the fact that, well, we used regressions to estimate them. We used the slope function. And also, these estimations can suffer from uh, heteroscedasticity uh, in the cross section. As well, returns of different stocks are uh, volatile to different extents. If you have a stock like Tesla and we have got it in our selection, it would be much more volatile than a stable stock like Walmart. And that leads to conditional heteroscedasticity affecting the efficiency of the estimation, so affecting the standard errors. So, what uh, Farmer and Macbeth proposed to address this is to calculate daily risk premia using daily regressions, cross-sectional regressions of daily returns of the stocks and their betas that we have already estimated. So our independent variable, that is beta, would not change throughout our sample, whereas our returns would be different each and every day. And that would allow us to calculate a robust standard error and a robust t-statistic that would account for uh, mismeasurements of beta, potentially, over here, as well as cross-sectional heteroscedasticity. To do that, we'll have to estimate each day the risk premium, a rolling risk premium of sorts, using a slope function and inputting our daily returns for all stocks, but not the benchmark. And we regress them every single day on the very same betas that we have estimated here. And that means that we'll have to lock the row. And then, to quickly estimate it throughout the whole period, we can just use the Ctrl D shortcut. And we'll be able to compare the results for a naive or less regression that doesn't take into account measurement errors or uh, cross-sectional heteroscedasticity and the robust results that do. So for a conventional t-stat, we'll just divide the coefficient by the standard error from the Linus template, and we'll have a promising t-stat of 2.16, with a p-value coming from a two-tailed t-distribution, where you plug in the absolute value of the t-stat and the number of the degrees of freedom, conveniently reported in the Linus template, and that would give us a p-value of 3.1%, which is significant at 5%, meaning that if uh, beta mismeasurements and cross-sectional heteroscedasticity are not accounted for, Kappa seems to work, with a relatively small, only 4%, but statistically significant, risk premium. However, if we address the issues identified above using the farmer macbeth procedure, if we calculate the average daily risk premium across the sample, and we calculate its standard error, the robust t-stat would show us what this t-stat should have been in the first place. So to calculate the standard error of our daily time varying risk premium, we can use the sample standard deviation function, so stdv.s, and input our risk premium we have estimated in this column. But to adjust it uh, by the sample size, as we do with any t-test, to be totally honest, we can divide by the square root of the count of said daily observations, minus one. Minus one, as we have um, introduced one restriction, the mean, and nothing else. Uh, this is effectively the t-statistic of a regression of this time varying risk premium onto a constant. This is how many um, explanations of farmer macbeth regressions um, elaborate on that. So we can uh, use this procedure and calculate a standard error of 0.035%. And the robust t-statistic, therefore, would be the average divided by the standard error, yielding a robust t-statistic of only 1.09, which is much lower than the one we have obtained previously using the naive way. And here, for a p-value, we can still resort to a two-tailed t-distribution, inputting the same number of degrees of freedom, and verify that the p-value obtained using the farmer macbeth approach is insignificant. And that has been one of the findings of Farmer and macbeth originally, that if we adjust uh, the results accordingly, uh, very often we would see that, as uh, the researchers themselves put it, beta is dead, meaning that 
the market factor has not explained the cross-section of stock returns well enough, and the results were often not statistically significant. And that is what prompted many researchers later on, especially in the 90s, to come up with multi-factor asset pricing models, and this is what uh, gave birth to the asset pricing literature as we know it today. However, this is all there is for the pharma macbeth regression and its use to estimate robust risk premia for your asset pricing factors. Obviously, you could use not the market factor, but any other risk factor you suspect could impact the cross-section of stock returns. You could use multiple factors in the same model that would uh, make the estimation a little bit more bulky, but not conceptually different. Therefore, this is the template that can be used for this as well. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I make it to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel or consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.